Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Gen and I'm the chair of MIT Enterprise Forum New York. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization based in New York, um, uh, hosted by a lot of MIT alumni and industry professionals, and we organize monthly and now weekly thought leadership events. Uh, today, we're really excited to host uh, this panel on AR and VR and mainstream adoption. Uh, thank you, Cindy and the VR AR Association for being a great partner. And with that, you know, let me just duck out here and pass over to Cindy. Yeah. Hey, everyone. So uh, I'm Cindy Mallory. I'm the Emerging Tech Strategist for Worldwide Tech Services, and I'm really excited to be moderating today's panel. Uh, we're going to be dis discussing AR, VR, mainstream adoption, and what Microsoft and Mesh mean for the future of VR and AR. Uh, I'm looking forward to a great conversation on social interaction as real and virtual blend. Uh, Microsoft Mesh is a collaboration and communications tool. It's a platform uh, that Engadget described as Microsoft's ambitious new attempt at unifying holographic virtual collaboration across multiple devices, be they VR headsets, AR, laptops, or smartphones. Our keystone point of reference will feature public advancements accelerating the space made by Microsoft in the competitive ecosystem. We'll be covering everything from virtual meetings to corporate learning and large scale onboarding to patents and contracts shaping the future. So let's meet our panelists. Let's start with you, Yulia. Hello everyone, Yulia Barnakova here. I'm a principal at Hydric and Struggles, focusing on digital and innovation. And I help leaders really embrace and innovate with emerging technology. And I'm a big fan of mixed reality, a big user of it as well. And I'm also in the Microsoft MVP program where we do some collaboration with the Microsoft team on, on products and kind of shaping the future of, of what they do. And I was, fun fact, co-moderating the Ignite session when they announced Microsoft Mesh. So I kind of got an on the ground view of, of you know, how they were working through it. And thankfully there were no trolls that I came across because everyone was just so in awe of the announcement. So uh, looking forward to working with everyone today and discussing more. That's great. Uh, Michael, could you introduce yourself? Hi. I'm Michael Owen, and I'm a principal at Media Combo. We're a digital creative studio based in Brooklyn, New York. And we uh, produce a lot of interpretive content for institutions such as museums. And in the last five years, we've become very focused into immersive technologies for carrying out those sort of missions. And in particular, we're now very interested in using social uh, immersive platforms for education about critical thinking, um, 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 visual literacy, social emotional skills, and also in a separate but parallel vein about um, environmental education and bringing people together over great distances in social. I mean, I'm thinking about international collaborations between students of a high school or university age to discuss topics of common relevance to them. And especially that's taking off now because of what's happened with travel restrictions. Very good. Uh, Eduardo, hello. Hi. Um, I'm uh, Eduardo Nieder. I'm the founder and CEO of a, a company called Factual VR. Uh, we are a mixed reality platform to enable remote collaboration between frontline workers and, and experts. Uh, we allow experts to be teleported to the worksite through an avatar that is rendered in augmented reality, and we recreate a digital twin of the worksite in virtual reality at the expert's office. Make the two areas correspond, and we create a shared space through that. Um, we receive a grant for the Department of Energy, uh, an SBIR grant, phase one and phase two. We have been working with the uh, uh, electric utility in the mid-Atlantic uh, to uh, provide uh, use cases and, and expertise and actually how to use this technology in the field. And in addition to that, we recently uh, entered the defense space and, and we signed a, a CRADA, a collaborative uh, agreement with the Navy 
to support them in the remote maintenance of aircraft. Thank you. And last but not least, Kevin. Great. Uh, great to be here. Thank you very much. My name is Kevin Mulcahy. I'm the co-author of a book, The Future Workplace Experience, and I curate conversations specifically with the HR community on helping the HR community prepare for the introduction of new technologies into the workplace that are modifying and transforming how we work, how we learn, how we earn. And in the past, I've put together a number of uh, conversations and experiences with helping HR understand AI. And along comes that uh, just as HR were beginning to master AI, now comes another two letter acronym, VR, and then there's XOR, and then there's AR. So that's what I'm trying to do here is how do we help the HR community anticipate and prepare for incorporating VR into the, uh, their workflows to upgrade reskill, new skill employees. Thank you, that's great. Uh, and that, that leads us right into the beginning. Uh, I think it's important for us to actually define what exactly is a virtual reality enabled meeting. Yulia, if you wanna start us off. Sure, so when we work with, with business leaders across different industries, one of the biggest pain points uh, with, with so many is kind of how do we get more connected, closer to each other? How do we move beyond kind of you know, video conferencing, Teams, Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet, all that stuff, and, and really start to, to get back some of those connections, particularly that were lost in the, in the kind of the global lockdowns within the pandemic. And so what VR meetings allow you to do, or what they are, is it, you can put on a headset and then you can be kind of like with avatars around you. So it's if you think of almost like Second Life or The Sims, you know you're you're in a world that's Im that is immersive. You see, you know, in the at the Ignite uh, conference, we saw we were underwater and we were swimming around with fish, seeing each other sitting there in an auditorium, and we could kind of choose a fish and it would it would spring up into existence. So. The idea is you're having kind of a meeting like we're doing here, but it's completely around you and you can do pretty much anything in it. And what's what's really interesting there is that the sense of presence, the sense of connection is much stronger because, you know, when you take your headset off, you feel like you were there. You know, a lot of us, we tend to say, you know, we, we have to almost do a re-entry process into the real world because it does feel like you just literally get teleported back. So that's kind of the essence of what, what that kind of a meeting looks like. And what's, what's interesting too is it doesn't have to be in a VR headset necessarily or in a HoloLens, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It, it could be on a computer as well. So a lot of these platforms, including the Microsoft Mesh and others, they allow you to join through a computer as well. So that makes the environment much more inclusive for, you know, for pretty much all devices. Yeah, so I guess my next question would be, so we threw a lot of acronyms, VR, AR, MR. Uh, so how is a VR enabled meeting different than augmented reality? And then how is that different than a mixed reality meeting? Sure, so in a virtual reality meeting, if, if you're putting on a headset, then the entire world is blocked off. So you're seeing the, the entire world changes for you and you're seeing all of your colleagues or, or teammates or students in that environment with you. For an augmented reality meeting, this is, you're basically seeing your, the real world in front of you and the people who you're meeting with, they beam in as avatars. So you can, you know, you can take a real life wall and you could stick some sticky notes on top of it. And then an avatar of your colleague can join you and you can both be kind of doing sticky notes on the same wall in, in the place that, that you are. So it kind of, and that's what and kind of what we define as augmented reality because you can see the real world in front of you. 
And then in the mixed reality world, which is a term that Microsoft uses in particular, and especially something that mesh enables, you can now get a mixture of these different devices going. So some people could be in a VR headset, they can kind of have the whole world, uh, you know, occluded around them. Some people can be in an office, they can be beaming in people through, um, you know, their, their avatars into the real world. And some people could be joining on a screen kind of like a Zooms or a team or a Zoom or a team screen. And that way it's a it's really a, a mixture across the spectrum of video uh, plus uh, plus you know the avatars or some people call it holograms. And um, even with volumetric video capture, where you can actually scan people in, you can even see videos, you know, you can see actual projections of people that are pre-recorded. And that's actually something that if you saw the mesh announcement, Alex Kitman had a pre-recorded version of himself in virtual reality that we could all, you know, walk around him and, you know, see him you know, as if he were standing right there. And that is really the future. And that's why, uh, Microsoft Mesh is so powerful is because it creates this new ecosystem that we can all build upon. And, you know, I like to say that in, in this kind of a space, every pixel or voxel is kind of a canvas for creativity. You can put anything you want in this new world. And that has so many implications for collaboration, presentations, and learning as, as we'll talk about. So absolutely, definitely lots to unpack here. Yeah, so my next thing is, what does it mean exactly to see a player like Microsoft step in and make a collaboration platform that's meant for mainstream adoption? Uh, what does that implicate? So when micro, what's interesting about Microsoft is they have this platform called Altspace VR. So if anybody has, you know, has tried it out. It's something that actually, if, if you haven't tried it out, you can go there right now. It's um, Altspace VR, take a, take a look. You can set up a free account. And they have this platform where you can go in and you can, you know, you can go in as avatars. And then you also have the ability to, to project slides. You can you know, bring in 3D models into the space. So, and it's all for free, at least right now. So it's, it's very easy to try. And what's great about Microsoft starting to invest in this area even more with Mesh is that as the cost of headsets uh, starts to go down, and you know we're hearing rumors about the HoloLens for consumers, all of that is going to become one big ecosystem where eventually we can start to bring in, you know, our office documents, pop them in and have this, you know, an unlimited, uh, these unlimited monitors in front of us. We, and then we can bring in our colleagues as avatars and collaborate, you know, pretty much anywhere that we want. And that's really what's, what's exciting is that we're moving in that direction and this, you know, mesh and alt space and office integration is a really big part of that. All right, uh, this is for anyone. Um, what are examples of events or meetings that currently meet in mixed reality? So I can, I can offer a few. Um, I actually was part of one of the first all VR conferences last year with educators in VR, where they had, I think it was thousands of people in the old space platform. And since then, uh, we've had the Global HR Summit and even Burning Man was conducted in alt space. So, uh, you know, people from all kind of all walks of life are starting to realize this is a much more interesting way to meet than a video call. So that just one example or two examples. And it doesn't have to be all work. I was at the Sundance Film Festival in January and they built their own VR environment for the filmmakers. So whenever you get artists exploring with the intersection of art and technology, you really get some interesting manifestations of what is possible from the technology. And, and they had some features in that platform that when you mesh, you have your avatar, but the picture of your face was a camera that just captured your face. So I had all of my real face but I was on a little avatar body. And so that was an interesting test of, it's not avatar or real like Zoom, there are hybrids. And 
and so so the, the second thing that happened there, they had panels, they had interactions. It changes how people interact. And what each of us needs to think about is how can we affect the interaction for the better? It's not just because we can do it this way. It's thinking carefully about the technology to go, what types of interactions will enhance the interactions between people? And that's the appropriate use of the technology and not just because it's new. So that would be my, my view on that. I think it's... It, 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 sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, if, if we think about the, the kind of meetings that can happen in VR, is, is the use cases are, are just starting to appear, right? Is, is uh, our consumers and, and employees, right? And the consumer enterprise side start getting more familiar with, with, with the technology is getting mainstream. Uh, uh, use case is going to grow. Um, we talk, uh, you know, just just about non-work related. Uh, I guess before the call, we're talking about a comedy show, right, in VR, and we talk about people watching sports together in in, in VR. So uh, the the human human communication and interaction that happen in the medium is 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 really powerful. I guess the the use cases are starting to appear. I think this, and and what Kevin mentioned though is is the the sort of slightly parallel ways this has worked, the idea of marrying an avatar to an image, um, is very cool. But that is like a PC engagement. When you have your headset on, you can't do that. The closest you're going to get is where HP is going, and I think even Oculus later this year will be a measuring your face and your eyes and being able to more accurately project on your avatar what you're feeling and your body language, or at least your facial language, which is a very important part of your, your body language. Um, so that's exciting. But the real thing about being in a headset is that sense of, of presence that you, I mean, I was just showing v, a VR space Base that I've been working in to a friend who wasn't that familiar with a headset. So I put it on, got her to get to this, it was a frame VR space. She was there. Then I left her to go somewhere where we would not be contaminating the, the audio, put on, did our thing. And then when I came back, I took it off and she says, well, and I walked with, where were you? I thought you were here the entire time. So she really felt that she was in the same space as me, even though I'd made a strict point of being separated. And that separation could be thousands of miles. But the point is, is the feeling was one of being really close together, of closing any dif distance in time. And, and that is absolutely the, the power of, of, of this medium. Uh, Michael, are, are you suggesting that the sense of proximity is better than a Zoom call? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you mention um, Frame VR. That's actually one of my favorite platforms beyond AltSpace to, to use to kind of demo the power of what you can do in a, in a virtual space. Um, and I, I can put that into the chat, but it's, it's framevr.io. And you can go there and you can set up a free account in some public beta right now. And it's it's very easy to use. You can, you can start kind of putting things up on walls. I was just working with a friend who does, um, who does photography and we made just in, it was like 15 minutes, we made a really quick photo gallery for her where she, she, we kind of pasted everything on the walls. We made a link and then we invited uh, a lot of people to it. And everyone was in, you know, as little avatars walking around, they said, wow, this is so, um, you know, it's, it's very different than what we typically see. And of course it's not, you know, it's not the same as, as seeing it all in person, but, you know, especially in today's world, it was, it, it, it was remarkable what we were able to do in, in that platform in so little time. Well, it goes back to what's the purpose of meeting. And one of the big purposes of meeting is, in a corporate environment is to review workflows. And you can't review workflows in Zoom. Uh, but in, in VR, you can. And you just describe to be able to walk around and interface with, with uh, displays or with objects is part of, of working with a workflow. 
or the second part is decision making. Um, and and if if the technology, if a VR environment helps people be more present and make better decisions, then it's a great outcome. Uh, another one is, uh, in in a sense, enhancing some capabilities that we couldn't have uh, information available at our fingertips in a in a digital meeting or a Zoom meeting or an in person meeting. Uh, there's extra information, and we can really bring to the decision very efficiently in VR. So it's, I think for me, it's always looking at where is VR uh, adding to the decision-making or the workflow or the capability enhancing experience. And those are good use cases for it versus stressing people out on using them for use cases where it's, where there's a tax or a burden on putting on the rig or the device and and taking the time to get set up into the immersive environment in the first place. But I'm a huge fan. I, and I think what Michael said, we're just beginning to go, what are the best use cases uh, for, in my case, um, ha having meetings and interactions between employees be more productive. And Microsoft is showing us a direction in how to do that. If, if I were to add to, to that point, the, the, the points you mentioned are pretty important. Let, let me just elaborate in the, in the knowledge sharing, right? Knowledge, knowledge capturing, knowledge sharing, knowledge, knowledge transfer. Um, and as an enterprise, uh, uh, people and the ability for them, the knowledge they have is one of the main assets. Is, is there are elements where VR is, is very well suited? to help with that knowledge transfer, the knowledge acquisition, especially anything that has to do with 3D space, uh, physical interaction, muscle memory, right? Uh, brain is, is natural developed to think in 3D. If we're talking about activities that are 3D activities, you know, beyond having a, a two dimensional screen in front of us, uh, it's, it's actually physically grab uh, with objects, interact with objects, see the physical reactions, I can throw it, it falls, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the action and reaction ability that gets registered, the learning capabilities of the brain when we immerse in that environment is significantly superior than any other me. Uh, so knowledge retention, knowledge transfer is a significant value for the enterprises. Um, then when we talk about the knowledge, not only the ability to store it somewhere that they can consume, is the, the storage can be shared, right? So it's the synchronous, knowledge sharing. So that's when the decision making comes to me, right? Is, is you're really now in real time uh, 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 sharing information from one to another, coming to a conclusion uh, that, that that ability also, uh, uh, you know, facilitates when situational awareness is key. Uh, again, we talk about the sense of presence that VR brings about or augmented reality. Um, with that comes the notion of situational awareness, right? Is, is people now have not only the view of FaceTime that has a really you know, a, 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 a narrow window into the world is, is we can bring all this information that is, is contextual, that the brain will absorb and process without too much of a cognitive load, it kind of just happens, right? Uh, so th those, those are, I would say, uh, main value uh, elements of, the, of this technology to enterprise. Yeah, yeah. I'll go, go ahead, Cindy. No, 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 go ahead. You guys are doing great. No, I was just going to add to to Eduardo's comment about just feeling that that sense of presence and almost like making memories in VR because I think it's a very very powerful aspect of it. So one thing that I always talk about with um, kind of in the business setting is, you know, even if you're make if you're doing kind of an offsite, you know, with your team, just or a small meeting that's that's informal, um, in a space like Altspace VR, you can actually you know throw snowballs at each other. You can ha you can like launch little rockets, like even small things like that that are really kind of. I mean, it's a little bit silly, but it makes memories. Like you remember that meeting much, much better than kind of a virtual Zoom or Teams happy hour. So that aspect of it is, is very powerful. And another uh, example uh, that I also thought of in terms of you know being able to move 3D models around, which you also mentioned, Eduardo, is I did a presentation once where 
um, I was on a, on a stage, kind of like a TED talk stage. And I took, I, I hid an elephant behind the stage. And actually in the middle of the presentation, I grabbed it with one hand and I put it right on top of the audience. And I was, I forget what point I was trying to make, but it was some, I think it was something around, you know, how you can use 3D models in VR and people will never forget that. I mean, having an elephant placed on top of their head <laughs> during a presentation that like people felt that people were like, um, excuse me, there's something on my head right now. They moved around, they walked around the model. And so it's things like that, that you can really do that, that really cement the learning, cement the experience. And just to add to that uh, in let's say, the old space environment, you can choose different spaces for the different meetings. There are some meetings where you just want a different mood and you want people to stand in a circle and, and share. There are other meetings where you may want them around in a table or meeting format. And, and so the ability not to be underestimated of picking the right environment for the right meeting versus sometimes what we've done is and, and I love that notion, Ulia, of just the, the context in which you have the meeting plays a role in the effectiveness of the meeting outcome. And we sometimes just use the meeting space that's available to us instead of also thinking a little bit more about what is the role of the space in which we hold the meeting. And in a digital virtual world, uh, you have more options to enhance the experience and memory and, and um, immersiveness of that meeting, not to be overlooked. Yeah, in, in frame VR, you can actually kind of at the snap of a finger, you can change the entire environment. So just like you change a slide in PowerPoint, you can just, you can literally go from like the desert environment to under the sea, you know, you can change all of the 3D models that are in the space and it's all in, at the click of a button. So it just kind of goes to show the massive new creative possibilities. No, absolutely. Frame is, is great. And um, I mean, I think though it's the difference between, you know, alt space and mesh is the controls that are now going to be possible in terms of managing who's coming in, who has access, where they can go within the space, having accounts, being able to monetize an experience in a space, which is what Engage has basically got the, the big lead on now. And in fact, because of HTC's involvement with now Sync, they're doing, they're creating their whole business centric parallel um, to that. So I think it's completely um, I mean, it's, and Mark is here, I'm sure able to take with this. I mean, it's the corporate environment that has completely embraced VR more than um, cultural and um, education. And I mean, they, there's, there's a real return on investment, which is much harder to, I guess, um, pinpoint in education and cultural exercises. There's still a thing of like, you know, what, 15 years ago, a guard would make you put your phone down in a, in a you know, gallery, don't take, don't take pictures, you know, uh, and now it's, they want to boost their Pinterest account, you know, it's like ridiculous. So we're, there's, there's a, we've got to get beyond, we're cannibalizing the assets to where extending these assets to much broader potential audiences. Thank you, Michael. That's a great segue. Uh, Mark, hello. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question and have you give a little intro. So what are the, the implications of MR and VR for the future of work and collaboration, um, especially on an enterprise scale? Oh, sure. So my name is Mark Grobe. I run the Center of uh, Immersive Technology at UPS. Uh, so we've been uh, doing the whole immersive tech mixed reality stuff for, for a while now, specifically in training and things like that. So now and also the future, right? Uh, the pandemic sort of just kind of accentuated the need for it, but the idea of, uh, you know, the power of being able to sort of virtually meet and learn, um, you know, it's just, it's more apparent than ever. 
um, you know, in, in enterprise specifically, you want to look at it more as when we talk about training, it's not about knowledge per se. It's more about the ability for an employee to become productive as quick as possible, right? And VR is very effective as, at that, as well as obviously we're exploring areas in mixed reality where, you know, when you're in the environment versus in virtual reality. So, you know, it's the whole idea of sort of what we call like the three basic things you want to get done when you're doing training, right? You want to make sure the, the new employee is confident in the environment that they're in, right? They're familiar with it. They're comfortable with it, right? Two, they have confidence in the content of the process or whatever it is that they're doing, right? And three, it's also they are able to be sort of walked through at different sort of pace based on the type of learner, right? So these are very unique things that this type of technology offers that, you know, in the enterprise space, um, you know, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent that that's where you're going to get your competitive edge with scaling up, upscaling, and, you know, descaling employees. So it's an exciting field and, uh, you know, we're really excited about the technology. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to corporate learning, where do you see platforms like Mesh playing your role? So, you know, products like Mesh, um, there's other sort of products as well that have been out there, right? The, the sort of big value piece that we would see is say in design, the aspect of being able to collaborate in sort of real time in remote locations, remote sites, saving on things like being, you know, having to transport someone to a location to collaborate. Uh, those are huge cost savings from the standpoint of our return on investment. Uh, also, your ability to execute, right? So it may take two days to transition from site to site, right? Technology like Mesh um, and other similar sorts of pieces out there, right? It gives us the ability to sort of, you know, just turn it on, right? We can just turn on a collaborative session and we're able to work, we're able to get things done. Um, you know, there's technology like Mesh where I can see spatial data in real time as we're working together and I can annotate that, right? And that this way, that technology sort of can be reintegrated into say something like Navisworks. So if you're doing design, right? People can annotate in the virtual space in real time. And that feedback is being passed back, you know, remotely to say a drafts person and they're getting the feedback. So that's kind of, you know, the real sort of exciting part of this is the aspect of sort of immersive collaboration where you're cutting out that time loss between, you know, transitioning from site to site. I would say, it, you know, probably the, the main, the, the industry that's going to be disrupted the most, but things like mentioned would be the travel industry. <laughs> so, Mark, you were right, is the cost savings of having to take a trainer through uh, location to location across the nation, across the world, is, is, is the sort of the nightmare story from trainers. Uh, people that dedicate, that have accumulated a lot of experience, knowledge in their, in their career, especially people are getting closer to retirement age and whatnot, uh, uh, is is the, the prospect of having to travel to the locations to, to train, to teach, is, is a main concern. And, and reducing that friction, taking that, that pain out of the equation, not only from the, the cost of, you know, the, 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 the dollar amount that comes with the travel, but even the the ability now, many people will be able to train from retirement, right? Is they're going to be able to go into the, the vacation homes and what have you, get into this kind of technology and, and flip us a switch. They appear somewhere and they have all the context that they would need to be able to do that in person. Uh, so that that ability to, to remove the friction that comes from, from distance in terms of training in the corporate environment it would be, it would be, I think the the the, the main uh, pain that, that someone like Mesh will take out of the question. I mean, yes, because a lot of this sort of even in education, the sessions are synchronous. It's not a you're not as an individual interacting with a set of information, getting it right or wrong or learning. A lot of times, there's a dialogue and a process. So you need the expert or the facilitator. Um, and now one person can remotely do a session in the morning, a session in the afternoon, and a session in the later afternoon, 
three places that might be thousands of miles apart, but they're available to interact with people in the context. And so you can have groups of people who are actually meeting physically the same, but in VR, or they don't necessarily have to be in the same place, but there be, you know, you're, you're teaching Chicago in the morning, you know, St. Louis in the afternoon and Sacramento in the evening, you know, that's entirely possible. That just wasn't before once the sort of methodology of doing this kind of immersive instruction is, is available. Well, isn't mesh um, particularly well suited for workflows, right? Because any, any of the VR devices could be used for remote training if you're completing a module to do some interactive training on, on um, uh, how to replace some parts in the machine or how to lay out a particular configuration at a hotel room or at a restaurant. One, well, there's those are training, but you don't need mesh to do that. But what mesh really see, appears to do is, is where it's in workflow, where you're in collaboration, where you're jointly creating, where you're interacting with what you're, what you're seeing in front of you with others. That, that to me seemed to be what mesh adds to the, um, to the space versus what was, what was not there before mesh showed up. And I'm just wondering what else people see is what did Mesh add to the world of collaboration that wasn't there the day before Mesh? So I would say it's fair to say that there are other alternatives to Mesh in the marketplace, right? So, and, and there are many of the big players going into, I would say one of the interesting cases or alternatives to Mesh is, is what Niantic is doing uh, as, as the, the air cloud, right? Is, is they're competing becoming this platform where, where all of this activity happened. Niantic is probably going in the gaming space, multiplayer gaming, definitely with, with Pokemon Go and take it from there, right? The, the rest is history. Uh, and, 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 you know, Microsoft is playing to the enterprise, right? So it's definitely the hosting, the, 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 the corporate assets and the information that goes there with, with Microsoft is, is well known versus you know, someone like Niantic will go. Uh, the capability itself, again, is, is the, the multi-user is an element critical of the simulation in VR on your own. Yeah, you can go into VR and, and, and do your training yourself. It's not the same when you have now a human being or a like feeling a human being next to you, be able to demonstrate what to do is, I guess, computer-based training versus tutoring, <laughs> you have to put it in some way. Um, you know, the, the, the having the person next to you showing in a human-like way uh, 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 in a demonstration is, it, it's, it's, again, it's, it's different cognitive processes, right? They get activated. And it's difficult to, 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 to compare. Um, so that, that ability, I think, that Mesh brings about, again, is not the only platform that brings it. It's, it's multiple uh, players are getting into that space. But, you know, that coexistence is the ability to see many people next to you and have human to human like communication, human body language. And we talk about, you know, the, the uh, ability to in the near future to show facial expressions in the in the avatars as well. Right. So uh, uh, the, the enrichment of the communication, the human human interaction um, is what a platform like this enables. The other interesting thing about Microsoft's ecosystem that I think eventually will be playing playing a role here is that they have the the connect cameras that are that have typically been used for gaming but now we're seeing more and more companies actually start to use several connect cameras to create kind of a mini volumetric scan of a person and then start to broadcast that live and so it, we're still in the very, very early stages of that, but that you know, once they're they're able to to really bring that that technology and their volumetric capture studios, which is how they were able to get the kind of the the avatar or the hologram version of Alex Kitman into the into the Ignite conference. Uh, once that starts to become more popular or that becomes more democratized with something like a connect camera, then we'll all be able to kind of 
scan a version of ourselves and then maybe even broadcast that live into a into a VR environment, which is really going to be even more game changing for what we can do creatively. Yeah, one more thing to add to this. What I'm kind of hearing, thinking from an enterprise standpoint, right? What what has Mesh sort of, you know, alerted everybody to, right? Part of it is the idea of, you know, in the end, what's this all about? The hardware, the technology is now allowing us to sort of fabricate and create new experiences, right? Or different ways to sort of create a collaborative environment where people are enjoying the sort of the flow of the experience, right? Um, you know, kind of at the higher level, when you look at the enterprise, right? People utilize technology based on how they feel and how they, you know, what sort of personal reward they get when they use it, right? So when you look at a product like Mesh or Spatial or, you know, the other sort of products out there, they're equivalent, right? Part of it is it's the experience of collaborative learning that, you know, is really kind of becoming very interesting because now we're finding First, for example, in the VR area, right? We now have a hardware that's not very costly and it enables us to now be able to do these sort of, you know, collaborative experiences together that, you know, provides good value for trainers and, you know, whatever the particular scenario is about. So it's interesting. Yeah, and, and Mark, you mentioned Spatial, which is another uh, leader. We'll po post that in the chat too, but that's another leading platform in the space. And they do actually a lot of collaboration with Microsoft and others. And what's interesting about Spatial, and I think somebody mentioned this before, is just how they approach avatars. So for them, instead of having a, you know, kind of like frame with the option of having your video next to your avatar, they actually kind of like engage, they pu put the, you know, your picture on top of the avatar. So I'm curious how, how everyone here thinks about that versus a more of a kind of a cartoon character versus maybe something more elaborate, like we'll see in, you know, VR chat or something. Um, just curious everyone's experiences, especially in the business world, which can be a little well, there, there, There's a movement, or there was a movement up to this point of bring your authentic self to work. And part of that movement gave people more freedom in how they showed up at work and, and, and relaxed their dress codes or colored their hair or wore body jewelry. But there was a sense that that was relaxing. You could show up a little bit more how you wanted to show up. So what I hear in the debate is, should avatars have a corporate dress code? And, you know, we are big five, whatever, I won't blame the accounting firms or the consulting firms. And so there's a certain code that we show up on, or are we a company that wants to allow people more expression in how they show up? And sometimes people have tremendous creativity in, uh, in showing up in Avatar. And one of the biggest digital uh, ex expenses in some of these online games is clothing, Avatar clothing. And, and so do corporations want to open that door and how are you going to put out some guidance on that or how free and open are you going to be? But it's hard to reconcile with the bring your authentic self to work movement. So uh, I'll, I'll put, that's my frame is it's, it's a Pandora's box right there. Uh, when you put in corporate policies and avatars and how you want to dictate how people show up. I mean, groups like glue from Scandinavia, I mean, they're, they've reduced it down just to pretty much the head, which is a sort of large cartoonish head, but based on an image of an actual image of the individual and then hands. So you don't have to deal with tracking or imagining what the rest of the body would be doing. And I, I think full body movement of avatars is going to, people are working on it, but it's, it's certainly not there yet. But whether you go from literally sticking with something just like the head to the whole body, and then, you know, um, obviously in, in a corporate event, you their employees or their participants, their, you know, and, and it, certainly at a college level, you're there in class. When you get into sort of younger groups of education, you actually have to anonymize them for 
privacy reasons. So then the issue of the avatar is actually something different. It's like what can represent them and give them a sense of an identity in the virtual space, but not to a third party observer who doesn't know them. Um, no, that's, you know, Jenny from 86th Street. I mean, uh, so the, the, there are different considerations depending on the groups involved. And obviously it reigns from, I mean, the reason for school uniforms was exactly the issue Kevin was addressing in a broader sense. Um, you want everyone focused on the subject matter. And if you get everyone worrying about the guy with the $10,000 Gucci suit, and there really was one, um, you know, then what, you know, that becomes a dif disruptive factor in the process, though not unlike some aspects of real life. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting, Michael, because Gucci actually is, as you probably know, getting into the digital clothing space. So I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that you, you know, we will be seeing more and more digital first clothing in the business world. There like, really um, was a $10,000 sale. Oh, it was? Okay, yeah. it was an actual. I know about like some of their... Uh, like the sneakers and accessories. I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. And now you're touching upon the whole NFT realm, which is another <laughs> can of worms, but um, yeah. Know, and if, I, if I might, let, let me, let me just yeah. touch upon if, if I would try to interpret your question from a different point, right? So is avatar has to be human like, you know, realism versus more of a cartoonish uh, uh, comic uh, presence. Um, there is there is a good amount of research on the cognitive effects uh, effects of of realism in avatars. A uh, human brain is very accurate at catching when things don't look right, um, and and it brings a notion of the the candy valley. Uh, depending on the so the answer is that there is no one answer for all the cases. In some cases, getting character or cartoon like is actually beneficial. Uh, I would I would make the metaphor of what Michael was saying. You know, it's not distracting, right? So the ten thousand dollar Gucci, it could be a distraction. Is you know a, a, a funny, a scary looking, trying to pretend to be human but not quite human. It can be scary and and detract from the tension. That's where the race for volumetric video and making realism is is going. There is a significant amount of research and, and energy made on that. Um, my view is unless we are really good at it and make it really, really uh, convey that, you know, passes that threshold uh, uh, from practical uses in enterprise, we are better off actually using more uh, mannequin kind of a uh, character, a figuring, a uh, comic. Uh, in our use case, again, we, we're actually using a, a, a wood kind of character to represent the avatar. So we're taking gender, uh, color, uh, any kind of personal information and focusing on the physical movements, right? So uh, again, to the question is, do we go into a realist, re realistic avatar or are we going to a cartoon? Uh, uh, not one single answer depends on the situation. Uh, there is a lot of research to make it, make it the threshold to, to cross that edge. Yeah, I mean, I, you're right. It's, it's gotta be research. And I think it's very, very much tied to the intended use case. I mean, you can see like Engage is very much corporatizing the looks of their uh, avatar dress. So now people look like they're from Man From Uncle episodes and with black jackets and very thin ties. Uh, and it's entirely possible that people will spend their mornings and early afternoons online in, you know, avatars that look very, know, sort of conventional, and then they'll hang out in VR chat at night looking like some kind of outrageous person because in the real world, they would have been nightclubbing, but you don't do that anymore. You know, what What can I say? I mean, that to me, VR chat is the sort of the nightclub extreme where people spend a tremendous amount of time on what they look like. Um, and, you know, I, you know, that that's interesting but certainly in terms of any kind of meeting where you care about not being trolled, I would not recommend VR chat as a 
as a destination, um, but it's a great place to sort of hang out if you know of something that's going on there. Oh, come on, Mike. You know, wearing the red fox avatar, walking around and, you know, not being yourself, you know, come on. Uh, no, I think to, to kind of answer the question for real, right? Um, you know, in an enterprise world, it's about sort of, it's going to be always a question of brand and level of professionalism, right? Um, there's sort of that, uh, like at UPS, lately, we've had a lot of changes in the standpoint of tattoos, clothing, and things like that, you know, because it used to be at UPS, you wore brown, you wore a button-up shirt, you know, you were, you know, corporate, and that was that. Um, yeah, but even in our sort of environment, you know, it's the question also relates in avatars to the corporate culture, right? To your enterprise's culture. Um, you know, I think if you look at a very creative sort of enterprise, you know, the argument would be, you know, what, whatever, you know, expression they want to have, they can, right? So the question is, if the avatar is an expression of self, right? The question is then, you know, wh where should it go? Right. If there was a question about legal proceedings, right, and the idea of sort of using VR to do collaborative uh, sort of legal proceedings, I mean, my feeling right now would be no, don't do it, because depending on sort of what the process, legal process is that you're following, right, the aspect of sort of that personalization, the 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 limits of the technology in regards to you know checking someone's, you know, physical tick because they're lying or something like that, right? The technology doesn't allow that yet. You know, when it does, hey, maybe, you know, it's ready. But in the most simplest form, right, what's the avatar? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a symbolic, iconic representation of you in that virtual space, right? Uh, in enterprise, right, we're seeing the trend where they're making it, they want to keep it very professional. They want to bring back the tie in IT, right? Because we got rid of it and, you know, that's what they want to do. So, you know, I think it boils down to what's culture, right? Um, what's sort of the, the professional standard in the business sector that you're in that's going to dictate that? Um, I, I'm all for it going back to, you know, being your authentic self. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, with the introduction of technology, right, we always have new influences on, you know, where they want to see the technology go. So who knows? We'll see. I think we we are seeing at least some emerging signals of VR being used to kind of recreate crime scenes or kind of like show people kind of immerse people you know in the world of of what happened to kind of give a more you know visceral effect. recreations. Yeah. So I think we're starting to see that you know or like the early beginnings of that but yeah it's still it's probably too early to kind of have a whole you know trial with a jury you know you know in different places yeah, that, that was that was kind of my interpretation too was yeah. what they mean by right i interpret it as literally doing a virtual court sort of yeah scenario. and all i can totally see right now it's total <laughs> sense to do the whole sort of virtual yeah. you know use data visualization to you know recreate crime scenes so that that makes total sense you know if you're talking about that that makes total sense in, in the environment, right? I've heard uh, stories about Boeing or uh, Lockheed going and when they have specific aircraft crash sites, right? They actually are using LIDAR scanners to actually scan the site or trying to get the first responders to scan the site before they do anything because they want to actually get sort of the, the data analysis of a physical crash site, right? One for litigation later and two for actually, you know, real sort of research and science. So the yeah, data visualization and legal, oh, 100%. But to do the collaborative legal, I'm like, I don't know. What do you guys think? No. <laughs> yeah, f funny, funny the conversation went that way. That, that's actually the origins of, of, of our company. We started with the forensic science and crime scene investigation as an end use case. Uh, it's fascinating the amount of technology, you know, the, the, the uh, sophisticated police departments, they do 3D scanning to, to do crime scene uh, capture. Uh, this is sub-millimeter, really expensive scanners that you can recreate a bullet trajectory out of that 3D scan. Uh, sadly, all of that information get reduced to two-dimensional artifacts that you can take in court. So, uh, you know, we do we see a, a court proceeding taken into remote meeting? Um, I, I have to pay a parking ticket over Zoom. So I guess we are having courts. 
this kind of medium and and the more common they become the more people will have why not go in vr and as you know uh, be in front of the judge there using the technology as a core proceeding like the, you know demonstrating the rule of evidence coming to it that's another panel i'll be glad to tell uh you know a good amount of implications that come with it uh it is not a trivial matter uh but but it's really powerful and could be really promising and, and Mark, you mentioned uh, LIDAR scanning before, and, and that's actually, I think, another really interesting development recently is that, you know, now with, with the new iPhones and the, and the, I, like the, the uh, more advanced iPads, you can actually, pretty much anybody can create a 3D model of a space. I mean, it's still very, very early stages, so it's not, you know, extremely professional quality, but we're, you know, you're able now, especially if you do a very careful scan to bring in, to, to create basically 3D representations of whatever you have, uh, like a room, or it could be an object, and you can then bring that into a virtual space. And then you can have, you know, a, a class or a meeting with that scan uh, you know, examining that scan, working through that scan, collaborating on that scan. I think somebody had a question about like 3D collaboration using 3D models. But I think what's what's exciting is that that's becoming democratized with kind of in, improving technologies on the on phones. Uh, we'll soon be able to to get I think really good scans that we can import ourselves without having a, you know a huge volumetric studio like Microsoft does. So I'm gonna, I, I need to take advantage of that and get a, 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 a kind of insert of the, our capabilities. Our platform actually has the ability to do that. We can take the both the, the iPad uh, LiDAR scanner and the iPhone as well as the, the HoloLens and create a real-time scanning of your work site in a matter of seconds, right? So that, that gets uh, recreated as a digital twin we compose. Uh, the ability to then have all that conversation with that information that's that's i think is the key is what we try to bring about uh that technology is improving uh, at light speed right the precision of those scanners is improving the, the precision of the sensors is improving um uh, you know many many of those those capabilities will go into the glasses as the hololens has the ability so even the scanning happening without you human intervention right so kind of just there uh, so that, that ability to, again, capture a 3D space, recreate it. Uh, we have the ability to then create a simulation out of that space. So we, what we will do is create a classroom. So once we scan the worksite, that becomes a simulation space. People can practice procedures. Uh, 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 and they can play what if, which is one of the key elements, right? Especially if it's a dangerous kind of worksite. You don't want to mess around with an electric substation and make a mistake because it might actually explode. Uh, if you explode the digital copy of it, you know you you have a good laugh. Uh, so that 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 ability to to uh, real time get the 3D data from the work sites and again do the scanning, uh, that's opening a, a significant other door for the real time collaboration. I can add something there too on the enterprise side. Uh, we've explored actually doing things where we would go to business clients and we would actually scan out their warehouse space, right? in the form of sort of a service to help optimize their warehousing and distribution services, right? Um, so we really explored the 3D side of scanning it, but the problem we actually found was not the ability to scan it and present it, but to transform what we've scanned into something that's actually usable objects so that this way you can kind of, you know, manipulate it. That's where right now I think is, is the challenge more so, right? To have it in collaboration is one thing, but also have the ability to have tools to easily sort of take that 3D scanned uh, uh, lift, right, out of that scanned environment and have it normalized, right? Those, that, that's kind of, you know, there's still sort of explorations in there. And if we have any sort of Autodesk people or something like that, I'm sure they're going to start chiming in. But either way, um, you know, that's kind of, it's an interesting opportunity, right? It's just... Uh, it's more of the flip side to it. Once we've scanned it, how can we manipulate it to make it more usable from an experience standpoint?
Very good, guys. Uh, I'm going to flip the topic a little bit because we're nearing on the end. We're actually a little over, but I do want us to discuss one more point. Um, we want to talk about the $22 billion Microsoft contract uh, with the U.S. Army with HoloLens and what that impact is on the VR, AR industry. Um, any of you guys can take that away. I'll jump on this first. Um, we have a good relationship with Microsoft and, you know, seeing that sort of success for Microsoft really from the standpoint of an enterprise the person trying to deploy technology, right? Um, it sort of certifies that what they've been doing is going in the right direction, right? We know there's other companies in the space doing the same exact thing and competed for that, right? When you have something like a large organization like the Department of Defense to support indirectly, right, the advancements of that technology framework further, right, through their commitment to a company like Microsoft, right, that's very encouraging, right? Um, I'll tend to also reference uh, Mixed Reality Toolkit, which is a software that Microsoft provides, right? It's sort of the standard when you think about mixed reality applications because the quality and the capacity and the capability of what that software can do is where it is, right? And it's signifying. And then when you have a company like, sorry, the Department of Defense make a commitment like that, right? It, it says a lot. And for those of us that are in the industry, right? It really sort of confirms what, you know, we're all sort of, you know, being cheerleaders about. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, that, that, that makes it real, right? Is, is the, if we look at the history of Microsoft working in the space, it, it, it's, it's many years, right? So this is not a recent phenomenon. They have been working with the Department of Defense, pushing this and, and defining, but this makes it real. If, if we put it in perspective, right? This one contract, the $22 billion that the Army, and this is at the Army, this is not the Department of Defense. I, I will elaborate a little bit more on that difference. Uh, the, the is, is bigger than the whole mixed reality industry a couple of years before, right? Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it, it causes a ripple effect through the whole supply chain, the whole industry, the whole development platforms, hardware manufacturers, all, all the nine yards. So th this is gonna accelerate the, 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 the progress of the whole industry. Um, if we look into the, the, the ability of the, 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 this contract, again, this is the Department of Defense, it's only the Army, uh, Air Force, Navy, uh, you know, there are different different entities that have different relationships with Microsoft. The, the the contract that we saw is for a version, a, a customized version developed for the Army. So it's not the same HoloLens that you and I can buy in the Microsoft Store. Uh, that that HoloLens is called the IBAS. It, it cannot be purchased. It's, it's of course an uh, uh, international security matter. Um, the, 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 the ability to, to make it mainstream, I think is again, is the main element, it makes it real. It is going from the proof of concept, a prototype, let me see this use case, let me see what I can measure here, I can kind of prove some value into, okay, now we are, this is our day to day. And, and, and that will be a pivotal moment on, on this industry. There's a whole host, uh, implication too when i mean the army is where a lot of young americans go to build new skills so um if i'm a young american and i've joined the army and i'm going to be in the army for the next three to five years and this is how i'm going to learn my skills and my tasks and then i leave the army five six seven years from now we're talking about a generation of workers that are going to enter into corporate America. I'm sure UPS hires a lot of former army folks and other companies that have had rigorous multi-year training regime in VR. And that's going to hit corporate America in a few years. So, so there's that, what, it's not only what happens now, but it's what happens later, number one. And number two, the army is in a very unique position of not having to be as concerned about the data privacy issues. If I tell you this is how you're going to learn this task and I'm going to test and monitor if you're learning this task, if I can squeeze five or 10% out of um, your, your speed to competency on these tasks in the army, massive savings for the army there 
in, in really testing and optimizing every way to squeeze a few percentage points out of the efficiency of upskilling, reskilling, new skilling people in a way that you can't do if I joined UPS, right? There, there's a certain amount of level where a UPS supervisor can command somebody to do things before that UPS supervisor is suggested to take a different route on his way home today. <laughs> yeah, so, well, right? exactly. I mean, what you're talking about, I think more so, I mean, it's not a similarity that UPS has very much with the army uh, and on certain automotive things, we probably share certain methodologies um, is the fact that the military, any force, right, has is very proceduralized in regards to how they train, right? And the technology of VR or MR, right, it's very effective when you have that level of proceduralized training, um, because it goes back to my statement about why do we why do we foster and utilize proceduralized training, right? It's because if it's proceduralized, you can accelerate it, right? It's it's a lot faster than sort of a mentorship sort of approach to it, right? And it's way less resource heavy, right? Because what's the military about, right? It's about scale. It's about you know taking uh, you know units and units of people and getting them to walk in the same row, do the same thing, so that this way everybody knows what to do, right? And uh, you know looking back to what Microsoft's doing and other companies are doing, right? Immersive technology, VR, AR, is very effective at that exact type of training. So it goes back to, it's sort of an affirmation that, you know, as an industry, we're going in the right direction. Great points, Kevin. All right, I feel like that is a great place to leave it. Uh, you have all been so wonderful. Thank you for speaking. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this has been a great time. Pleasure, everybody. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. And start to uh, experiment. There's a lot of options that we pasted in the chat. So, so take care. sometime we should have a panel in Dior just to lead by example. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now it's just about everyone else accessing it. <laughs> Great. Right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.